and we're live. Hello everyone and welcome back and welcome to those of you who are with us for the first time. Thank you so much for joining us for the Frontline Club's monthly book night, Pranvera Smith's brilliant and very special idea because with this book club you can meet the author and it's a club that is not dependent on talking about just newly published books um, but also ones we've been wanting to read for some time or which we have read and love so much we want to share. Um, our authors have included Louis de Bernier, Alif Shafak, Keggy Carew, Amanda Craig and John Simpson um, and tonight we are so very honoured um, to chat with Philippe Sands uh, about the highly praised Bailey Gifford Prize and JQ Wingate award winning East West Street published in 2016 but which I only um, just read a few weeks ago um, on the recommendation from one of my authors who found inspiration from these pages when he was writing his own family story. I was so moved by East West Street that I immediately championed um, the book to Pranvera and have been telling everyone I know about it. The subtitle of this magnificent work is On the Origins of Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity. And on the face of it, as it were, it is an account of two men, um, of the two men, two legal scholars who influenced the outcome of the Nuremberg trials um, and who introduced to the world these two now commonly known ideas of genocide and of crimes against humanity. But this, there's nothing dry or legalistic about this book, even though it was written by a lawyer, in, in fact, a barrister, in fact, a QC. Um, instead, it is a story of modern history filled with pathos, with love, with loss, with hope, um, with fear and with the gamut of human emotions and characters and settings and a narrative that one might otherwise find in fiction, but as with any triumphant work of nonfiction, speaks louder and clearer and resonates. So by way of introduction, I'll simply crib from the abbreviated bio on, on the cover copy. So Philippe Sands is a professor of law at University College London and a practicing barrister at Matrix Chambers. He has been involved in many important cases in recent years, including Pinochet, Congo, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Iraq, Guantanamo, and the Yazidis. That's just including some of the. His previous books include Lawless World and Torture Team. He is a frequent contributor to the Financial Times, the Guardian, New York Review of Books and Vanity Fair, amongst others, and makes regular appearances on radio and TV and serves on the boards of English Pen and the Hay Festival. Um, Philippe, I did say earlier that you're a QC and, and it's very hard to find and you're very modest about it. And, I, and I, was, I was thinking, I'm sure he must be a QC. I had to kind of do a little bit of searching to find it. But I can't thank you enough um, for taking time out to chat with us. You must have a hugely busy schedule. And I do really look forward to our discussion. Well, at first, it's just really nice to be with you, Kelly, but also um, Frontline is a very special place. And, um, I, I visited many times. I've been in a few events there in person. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, what it does is worthy of strong support. And I'm really delighted to be part of part of your book club. Well, that's great. That's thanks to Pranvera. So look, I have a zillion questions and this conversation could, could go of course a myriad ways, but I'll focus on the book and the writing of it and the inspiration and the process and, and we'll see what unfolds, yeah? So, so many who are attending tonight, we have about 270 odd people so far. Um, many who are attending won't yet have read the book. Um, so we might be going over ground that both you and I understand or are familiar with, but which will need to be illuminated for, for the audience. Who, who, I remind you, please ask questions, everyone, and I will, um, I will feed your questions into our discussion. Let's move my Q and A box over here. Um, so let's 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 start talking. So this book, though it speaks of international law, um, which you specialize in. And, and, and in that way allows you to write what you know, as they always say. It starts actually though, from something much more personal. Um, your grandfather, Leon, and his story leading up to the Second World War and, and how your own family were affected by the war. 
and you you said you've said that um, of 80 members of your grandfather's family he was the only one to survive and could you tell us a little bit about leon Buchholz? how do you say his surname Buchholz. Buchholz. and the moment when your interest in him was peaked more than it might have been otherwise i'm referring to your visit to lviv hmm. and the student who approached you after a lecture you gave there well i mean i think you know for a lot of people relations between a grandchild and a grandparent have a very special quality. I've noticed it now with my own children who are in their 20s, that the relationship they have with my parents, with my wife's parents, is really a very special relationship. And mm -hmm. perhaps that might have had a role in causing me to reflect on my relationship with my grandfather, who I was very close to. Uh, and knew very well. Um, he died in 1997. He was 93 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had a long, healthy life in a physical sense. Mm -hmm. But he never talked about what happened during or before the war. And mm -hmm. my brother and I came to understand that this was not a door you opened. We, we knew it as children, and we knew that it was a protective silence, that mm -hmm. bad things had happened. And so I never asked him the sorts of questions that many grandsons would ask a grandparent. Mm -hmm. And I deeply regret that. I, I'm often asked what's the biggest regret I have. And the biggest regret that I have is that I never asked him the question, what was your mother like? Mm -hmm. Tell me about your mother. Because I knew, my brother knew one didn't go there. So he dies in 97, 15 years or so pass. And out of the blue, I get this invitation to go to an obscure city in, now in the Ukraine, today mm -hmm. called Lviv. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be called Lvov when it was part of Poland, and before that, Lemberg, when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and also mm -hmm. occupied by the Germans. Mm -hmm. But I like to come and give a lecture about the cases that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide. Mm -hmm. And I accepted, not because I had a burning desire to go there, because actually I wanted to find my granddad's house. It was as prosaic and simple as that. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I got, went to give a lecture that was, you know, they paid for the flight, but I took my mum, my aunt, my son, and it was the first time we worked out that any member of the family had been back to the city since 1923. And it was a wonderful visit. But I came bringing strange tidings, if you like. <laughs> They'd asked me to give this lecture on the cases, you've mentioned some of them, on crimes against humanity and genocide. And, and I spent a bit of the summer, you know, writing the lecture, and I was amazed to discover that the guy who invented the concept of crimes against humanity in international law, Herschel out of Pact, came from Lviv, studied at the law school that had invited me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's pretty amazing. And then I discovered that the guy who invented the concept of genocide also in 1945, also came from Lviv. They'd mm -hmm. both been to the law school, the mm -hmm. same one that invited me. Mm -hmm. But the people who invited me had no idea. And so I arrived and basically said, well, you know, the amazing thing is genocide and crimes against humanity started not just in this region, not just in this city, not just in this university, but in this very room where I'm talking. Mm -hmm. And I spent the next five years uncovering that story. And it was mm -hmm. a way, it was a double story. My relationship with my grandfather, mm -hmm. what happened to his family, people I vaguely heard of but didn't know anything about, mm -hmm. and the story of international law. And that was those sort of intertwined stories mm -hmm. that came together. Yes, yeah, so the student comes up to you after your lecture and says, isn't it your grandfather whose story that you really need to un unfold? And, yeah. and you learn we'll get to this like i hope later well we will later that you know your stories your grandfather's story and law to fact story and lemkin's story are they're they're linked in a certain way right um <clears throat> I, I should say when i went to lviv i had no intention to write a book um mm. about four or five months later my then editor at penguin stuart prophet Mm. what are you going to do next i'd done one on the the rumsfeld torture memos and the bush administration and guantanamo and torture waterboarding and i gave him five ideas uh -huh. and he said no you've got to write about your grandfather mm. and that's what you must write about that's really interesting and it was difficult for me because i've only 
both as an academic and as a barrister, one of the golden rules you're taught is don't write about yourself. No one cares about you. No one cares what you think. No one cares what your perception is or opinion is. And so I really had to have it you know, sucked out of me by a brilliant editor in New York, Vicki Wilson at Alfred Knoll, but it was very tough. Mm -hmm. I think that's a kind of old school journalism, you know, um, um, mantra as well. Some of my authors have written, you know, more personal books, including, you know, Michael Viticuitis, who I mentioned earlier, his new book is a family memoir. Um, and, and, you know, when he, when he wrote his previous book, I said, you know, look, we want to hear your opinion. We want to know you. We want, you know, you're part of the story. And he kind of, you know, bristled against that. But I said, this is the way, you know, it goes, you know, nowadays, it's particularly with narrative nonfiction. So. Well, I, um, I, by the time it, by the time Deborah Rogers, my then agent, sent the manuscript out to Melanie Jackson in New York, who then passed it on, and you'll know all these wonderful people, passed it on to Vicki Wilson and Alfred Klopp. That he got straight back, summoned me to New York and said, absolutely, I will publish this. Hmm. I thought I'd written a pretty good draft, I mean, not perfect. She said, but, hmm. but the condition, there are two conditions, Philippe. One is that I am the sole editor. And the uh, second is that you start rewriting it completely hmm. tomorrow. Hmm. And I had very heavy editing, which I needed. It was a wonderful experience. Hmm. And you work with B. Hemming as well, I know, at Weidenfeld. That well, what ex absolutely what happened was that um, Knopf wouldn't allow Deborah to uh, sell it in the UK after after Knopf had bought it, which was frustrating. So it was only pretty much after after it was pretty much done. I mean, mm -hmm. four drafts on five years, four hundred and fifty thousand were different drafts. Mm -hmm. Very stressful experience, but a great experience. And then Vicky said, "Okay, you can now go to the Brits." And I chanced upon an absolutely wonderful editor, B. Hemming, sadly no longer at Weidenfeld, has no. gone to Jonathan Cape. But I have to say that in that small moment, you know, of a few months in which there were still changes to be snuck in under Vicky's nose without mm. her noticing, mm. he was brilliant, absolutely mm. brilliant, a wonderful editor. She is, she is a wonderful editor. Um, I mean, how, what, I was going to ask you this later in the, in the discussion, um, Maybe, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll get back to that because I wanted to ask you about Weidenfeld. I mean, how, well, okay, we'll ask you now, how important was it for you to be published by, you know, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, you know, the imprint founded by George Weiden, Lord George Weidenfeld? It wasn't right? important at all, I have to mm -hmm. say. I mm -hmm. just was so thrilled to have a serious trade publisher. I mean, for someone who's written umpteen books, published wonderfully by Cambridge University Press, Oxford University mm -hmm. Press, Mm -hmm. which sell nine and a half copies, which I'm thrilled <laughs> of and proud about. The idea you'll have a trade publisher mm -hmm. is a very wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, B set up a meeting with George Weidenfeld, who of course was from the very region that I was writing about. Mm -hmm. And I was going off to have lunch with him and the morning, oh, actually it was tea, uh -huh. And the morning that that happened, I got a phone call from B to say George had passed away that morning. Mm. So I never met him. Yeah. I never spent time talking with him about the story, which I, I regret very much. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, he was busy till the end and he would still come into the office and, you know, very well dressed. And yeah, he was a, he was, um, a very special person. I felt really honoured to have met him and worked for him as well. well one up on me because i i never got to meet him i of course knew of him and i've heard so many stories about him yeah uh, so have i i've heard so many stories but look let's get back to the book i mean we've got a question here now that's a good question and i'm going to thread that in but i want you to talk to me about um um the the lviv lvov and the city as another character Okay, and how it links you so essentially to this to the story we've already discussed that but i mean i want you to tell me now about so much of the story hinging on the difference between this is like the crux of this book so much of the story hinges on the difference between the idea of genocide um a term invented and defined by this man called Raphael Lemkin whom you mentioned one of the main characters of East West Street and of quote crimes against humanity a concept identified solidified defined by Hirsch Lauderpack another of the book's principal characters you, you write Lauderpack and Lem Lemkin were two young men whose ideas have had global resonance, 
the legacies reaching far and wide. The concepts of genocide and crimes against humanity have developed side by side, relationship that connects the individual and the group. And so would you, would you mind just briefly telling us why the difference matters yes, and, why, yes. and why this difference allowed you to create such dramatic tension in the book? Let me say something though about the city because it is, I mean, it's there are four characters in this book, two crimes yes. and one city. And it is yes. an extraordinary place. Mm -hmm. I would say to everyone who's on run, don't walk. It is yes. fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's like dropping back into 1920s middle Europe. Okay. The inner city hasn't changed at all. You should stay at the Hotel George, which is about 35 quid a night. Okay. It has not changed since the 1950s, if you can bear that. I sort of love that I kind would love of that, yeah. And stuff. And the food is fantastic. It's one of the best coffee places. And you may ask yourself, why is the coffee so incredible? Because it's a city at a crossroads. It was a, at, a, at the interface of major trading routes. Mm -hmm. And the Italians got there pretty early, the Venetians. Mm -hmm. And they started setting up coffee houses so it's okay. it is an extraordinary place in the 1920s it was a place of three communities and this goes to the question of crimes against humanity mm -hmm. and genocide basically in equal numbers poles ruthenians as they were then called ukrainians today mm -hmm. and jews of a different religion mm -hmm. um you know roman catholic for the poles um uh, you know um Catholic, a Ukrainian Catholic for the Ukrainians and mm. Jewish for the Jews. Mm. And it, it, the 20s and the 30s was a story of how different communities lived together, very relevant to our times now, actually, um, in, in the United Kingdom, I think. There's a, a lot of resonances. And Lauter, Pact and Lemkin both lived through those experiences. And they also lived through the experiences of their families being left behind after they left. Lauter Pact went to Britain, became professor at Cambridge. Lemkin became a public prosecutor in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. But by the 1940s, they were watching with horror what was going on. Mm -hmm. And their families were in and around the city and the region mm -hmm. of Lviv. Mm -hmm. And this was the moment, 1942, 1943, that rather than sit down in a corner and weep, which I think they were both entitled to do, mm -hmm. They both thought, no, we, we are both international lawyers. We want to harness the force of the law. Let's come up with new ideas. And they came up with different ideas in parallel. They never knew each other. They never mm -hmm. met as far as I was able to discover. Mm -hmm. Now Pack was a passionate believer in the individual. And his revolutionary idea was to say that every individual human being, whoever they are, wherever they are, whatever they are, has minimum rights under international law. And that's modern international human rights law, that we all have rights, human rights, as individuals. Lemkin said, no, um, yes, we need to use the force of law to protect people, but people generally don't get targeted or harmed because of what they've done individually. They get targeted or harmed because they're a member of a group. Mm -hmm. And therefore, let us protect groups. And by protecting groups, we protect individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that, says Lauter Pact, but it's really problematic. What you will do is you will replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of groups. So I'm not going to support your concept of genocide. I'm going to go instead with my concept of crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. And come the summer of 1945, so exactly 75 years ago, the two men get involved in the Nuremberg trial and they basically market their ideas. They've both recently published books books and ideas are absolutely the heart of this story mm -hmm. how ideas can change the world and the prosecutors run with their two ideas mm -hmm. and crimes against humanity and genocide become part of the list of international crimes that nuremberg will prosecute mm -hmm. and into that story comes the fourth man in the story there's my grandfather there's lauter pact there's lemkin and into the story emerges the man who is really the glue that connects the three of them mm -hmm. his name is hans frank mm -hmm. and he is adolf hitler's personal lawyer mm -hmm. from 1928 to 1933 and later governor general of nazi occupied poland and remarkably lauter pact and lemkin prosecute hans frank mm -hmm. for mass murder for crimes against humanity in the mm -hmm. case of 
that a pact genocide in the case of Lemkin. But when that trial opens on the 20th of November, 1945, they do not know that the man they're prosecuting has killed their entire families or, or you know, millions of other families also, including my grandfather's family. And that becomes the drama uh, of the story, the relationship between Lauterpacht, Lemkin and Hans Frank. Incidentally, I'm just gonna put a, 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 pub, a bit of publicity in. Nicholas Frank, the son of Hans Frank, who helped me greatly mm -hmm. um, on uh, my book, mm -hmm. has finally this week got his book, which was published 40 years ago in Germany, is available in the United Kingdom, published by Biteback, okay. called The Father, okay. and it's already had some pretty interesting reviews. Okay. In the Telegraph, um, I think in The Times, okay. and is getting quite a lot of interest. It's okay. an extraordinary book. Yes, I mean, I was extraordinary. I was watching your film, um, the film that you made, um, The Crimes of Our Fathers, is it? Um, what, well, our no, fathers, what Our Fathers yeah, Did, yeah. A Nazi Legacy. And you have um, Nicholas Frank there with, with Horst von Vector and, you know, the two men at opposing, you know, with opposing points of view or opposing beliefs about what their father did. Um, anyway, and, and yeah, that's, that's a really fascinating film, which I would also recommend to, to everyone. And, and they... Yeah, there's a dynamic between the two of them and then also with you, you know, in that mix is, is very, um, it's an incredible dynamic. We've well, stayed in touch. Nicholas uh, has become a dear friend. Horst, I'm still in touch with. He's the subject of the rat line. Exactly. But they, don't, they don't talk to each other anymore. They do not. <laughs> this is Philippe Sand's next book. Um, it's called The Rat Line. It is about um, um, Von Vector and, and his escape to South America, correct? And, and this, this, the yeah. rat line of- That's right, Hans Frank was caught uh, in 1945, sent to the Nuremberg trial, tried, convicted and hanged. Mm -hmm. And the 75th anniversary of that hanging uh, will take place, um, 75th anniversary is in a few weeks time. Okay. And uh, Otto Wächter, who was Frank's deputy, escapes on the 9th of May, 1945, is never caught. And the rat line tells the story of what happens to him. Yeah, it's an extraordinary opening. I can't wait to read it. Um, but um, but I want to go back to this. The crime. I had kind of struggled myself when I was reading this to kind of understand why you know they were so gen the genocide and and crimes against humanity were so at odds with each other, and and how Lemkin you know really had to you know almost desperately on, on almost on his knees fight to get this term genocide into you know into the trial as a, as a form of prosecution for these people, and you know Lauterpack was sort of dry and and um, passionless. But you know, in actuality, he had a lot of passion. Um, but you know, Lemkin was sort of dismissed as a kind of as a not a serious scholar, right? A kind of lightweight. And 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 I was struggling to understand why you know how they were so different. And and I pull out two quotes here from you in your in the book, and you say page three sixty one, and this helped me solidify it in my mind. Lord Pack thought that quote, if one emphasizes too much that it is a crime to kill a whole people it may weaken the conviction that it is already a crime to kill one person. And then on page 380, you say, rightly, obviously, proving the crime of genocide is difficult. And in litigating cases, I have seen for myself how the need to prove the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part, as the genocide convention requires, can have unhappy psychological consequences. It enhances the sense of solidarity among the members of a victim group while reinforcing negative feelings towards the perpetrator group and makes reconciliation less likely. I mean, that's very resonant today. Just to take an example of part of the world you, I know, Kelly, are so committed to and interested in, there's been a lot of discussion of a community in China, a Muslim community called the Uyghur community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you will have seen over the last few months, there's been huge numbers of articles mm -hmm. about a, the genocide of the Uyghurs, or is it a crime against humanity? Mm -hmm. And I've written two pieces. I wrote a piece for the Financial Times and a piece for the New Statesman, saying I think we shouldn't get too sort of fetishistic about what we call what is going on. What we're calling on, what is going on is criminal, it's wrong, it's bad. But what has happened in the years since the East West story 
took place, East West Street story took place, is that cr crimes against humanity has gone down the pecking order. Mm -hmm. Genocide has gone up the pecking order. For example, if an American president says what's happening over there is a genocide, it will be on the front page of every newspaper, as it was a few weeks ago when President Biden said what happened in Armen to the Armenians in 1915 was a genocide. Mm -hmm. Every newspaper had it on its front page. Mm -hmm. President Biden has said it's a crime against humanity. If it had been in the papers at all, it would have been on page 27. In other words, in popular public consciousness, mm -hmm. genocide is where it's at. And I think what has happened with the Uyghurs is the term genocide has been used, is being used mm -hmm. to uh, attack China mm -hmm. and also to draw media attention in the knowledge that just calling it a crime against humanity won't attract sufficient attention. The bottom line is whether you kill or imprison or maim or torture 100,000 people, whether you call it a crime against humanity or genocide makes no difference whatsoever. They are both appalling, they are both equally criminal and illegal. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to encourage a rethink. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because most people think that these concepts have been around forever. Mm -hmm. People are very, very surprised that the two concepts were invented as recently as 1945. Mm -hmm. um, and why genocide attracts so much support and attention is really a matter of interest for me. And I've got two theories about it. One is that its association with the protection of groups touches each of us viscerally because mm -hmm we understand the sense of group identity and group pull. And the second is more linguistic. It's just that the, the term crimes against humanity seems technical and legalistic, whereas mm. genocide as a word in, literally invented by Lemkin just opens up the imagination. You hear genocide and you hear an absolute horror. I had a very interesting, apropos you know, Lemkin's difficulties in getting genocide take off, I had a very interesting um, conversation today with the British government minister on a project that I'm involved in, which is to fill a gap. Since 1945, there have only been four international crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, crime of aggression, and war crimes. Mm -hmm. And I've just finished co-chairing with a very distinguished Senegalese lawyer, a working group on the crime of ecocide to oh. amend the statute of the International Criminal Court and protect the environment through international criminal law. There's been a lot of interest in it, and today we were summoned to a meeting with the British government minister and asked mm -hmm. to, to make our case mm -hmm. for it. And the government minister, I have to say, was pretty open to the idea. His civil servants were not. Mm -hmm. And I, as I heard them saying, well, you know, we've got more important things to do right now. This is all a bit theoretical. Why do we need to do this? I heard the same arguments made about Lemkin. And I said to the minister, who shall remain nameless, um, Minister, back in 1945, your counterparts faced exactly the same difficulties. Mm -hmm. And it took a remarkably courageous, conservative former Home Secretary, who was a prosecutor at Nuremberg, David Maxwell Fife. I said, these issues are not party political. Mm -hmm. It's not a left, right, Tory, Labour, anything issue. It crosses across the spectrum. It took David Maxwell Fife to ignore his civil servants mm -hmm. and basically run with genocide. Yes in the Nuremberg courtroom. It was a surprise to everyone, wasn't it? That everyone. it kind of everyone. appeared all of a sudden and and, and a, surpri a happy surprise to Lemkin, who was distraught that all of his, you know, hard work and lobbying was, you know, all for naught, he thought. And then all of a sudden he heard on the radio, you know, this, yeah. and wow, and his, it was- Well, what happened was I mean, the, the trial at Nuremberg opened and genocide got a few mentions by the Soviets and the British, mm -hmm. and the, the Soviets and the French. The British refused to mention it mm -hmm. uh, under the jackboot of the Americans, as they already were. Mm -hmm. And the Americans didn't want to mention it. Robert Jackson never mentioned it because Southern senators from the United States were worried that genocide would be used in the United States exactly. uh, in relation to blacks and lynchings and Native Americans. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so the Americans never supported genocide. Mm -hmm. Six months then pass and the word genocide is not uttered in the courtroom at all until Lemkin lobbies David Maxwell Fife, who will go on to be famously the um, Conservative Home Secretary who deals with the Bentley case. Do you remember um, the Let Him Have It 
case, the famous case, one of the last men to be hung in Britain. Oh, yes, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. And yes. the question of pardon came before mm -hmm. uh, David Maxwell Fife, who declined uh, to pardon him. It was one of these extraordinary cases where Bentley says to his mate, who's holding the gun, let him have it. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are two interpretations. Uh, one is shoot him, mm -hmm. and the other is give him the gun. Mm -hmm. And the jury convicted him of murder mm -hmm. for having uttered those words, which were interpreted, I think, wrongly mm -hmm. um, as being um, shoot him. Mm -hmm. And Bentley, of course, was later pardoned. Uh, I think my father-in-law, who was a barrister, is I guess once was, always is. Um, he was involved with that case, actually. Angus Falconer. Angus Falconer. Um, it's an astonishing story, and it, it rather like genocide and crimes against humanity reinforces the importance of words. I mean, words are your life, <laughs> they're my life, and they're the frontline club's life, and uh, well, words really matter. Speaking of which, I've got a few questions from the audience. One chap in particular, but speaking of words. I want to ask you about the karma. Um, the karma that um, where was it? Page. Yes, it's in it's in the statute of the <laughs> the Nuremberg the, statute. It's the misplaced karma, isn't yeah. it? That yeah. I, mean, um, I use I use this with my students. So the, the the Nuremberg Charter, which included the crimes, including crimes against humanity, was drafted in three languages: English, French, and Russian. Mm -hmm. The English version at a particular place had a comma in it, whereas the Russian and French had a semicolon. Mm -hmm. And the effect of the comma in the English text was to bring within the crimes that the court could exercise jurisdiction over everything that happened mm -hmm. before war began on the 1st of September 1939. Mm -hmm. So on the English version, the tribunal had jurisdiction over everything that happened from the moment the Nazis came to power mm -hmm. in 1933. Mm -hmm. But on the Russian and French versions, the tribunal only had jurisdiction in relation to things that happened once the war began. Mm -hmm. And there was then two weeks after the charter was adopted formally in its three languages, mm -hmm. a revisitation of the comma and the British language gave way and the comma was replaced with a semicolon. Mm -hmm. And the effect of that was to exclude from the jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Tribunal everything that happened between 1933 and 1st of September 1939, mm -hmm. a hugely significant period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can't mind your commas, it may be said, they can have absolutely exactly. catastrophic consequences. So I'll, I'll ask you a question from Robert Nichols. Um, he's got three questions here, and hugely enthusiastic, um, which as I am. Um, so these are all good questions. He says, um, and this is one that mirrors mine, how, how he's halfway through, he loves the book. How important were your legal skills of sifting through large number of documents to get information and finding people to help you do that? Could, could, you, have, could you have written this book without your day job? Yeah, I wanted to, to feed that in that question and also to, to one of my questions that what you're humanizing of the villains. And I think this is one of your you know, master strokes um, because while we read about Lemkin and Laura Pack and your grandfather and other heroes, large and small, we must also, you know, sadly, as you say, read about Hans Frank as one of the other principal characters. Um, and, I, and I was wondering to kind of mirror Robert Nichols' question as a, as a writer and I wonder, if, if your work as a barrister and your powers of persuasion are informed by understanding, you know, this motivation of characters and, and then your ability then to, because you understand the motivation to unpick it. I mean, I think being, I think the training that I had as a barrister was hugely important. Actually, my very first pupil master was German. Uh, All right. Remarkable barrister who's still very much in practice, Barbara Doman. Um, who was a very tough pupil master when I was a very young barrister, but she taught me how to write. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she teaches is you, you know, you, you, you remove from your writing matters of emotion and opinion. You leave it as dry as possible. And I think my training, well, both as an academic and as a barrister, helped me deal with hugely sensitive 
very personal material mm -hmm. in a way that was slightly distant. So it's a book that evokes very strong emotions, but it's not an emotional book. I, and that was a, a purposely mm -hmm. uh, defined way of writing. I wanted to step back, let the facts speak for themselves, let the process of discovery speak for itself. And that really is, um, for Robert Nichols, I think very significant for me, a, a way of writing the book. And I think it's very connected also to your, 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 your point, Kelly. I, I never call Hans Frank a monster mm -hmm. because he wasn't just a monster. He did monstrous things, but he was capable of humanity, of love, of decency, of generosity. And this is, of course, the complex, how do highly intelligent, highly cultured individuals get involved in mass murder? I mean, as Nicholas would tell me, um, Frank could recite Shakespeare and Goethe ad nauseam. He was friendly with the composer Strauss and all the great writers of that period who were not Jewish. Mm -hmm. And he was a very highly cultured individual, a world champion chess player. Mm -hmm. And yet he was ambitious and he was married to a woman who promoted his ambitions mm -hmm. and drove his ambitions. And at the moment that he wanted to get out in 1942, I think it's fair to say that his wife pretty much stopped him. Mm -hmm. And as with the rat line, I'm completely fascinated mm -hmm. by the relationships between couples in these difficult times, mm -hmm. in part because they show the weaknesses and the humanity of individuals who do unconscionably dreadful things. Mm -hmm. But I think the crucial question we all want to know is how can people do such things? And I think to understand that, to answer that question, you have to humanize them. You know, one of my favorite films um, is Downfall, that film that shows the last oh. day Hitler in his bunker, very heavily criticized in some quarters, precisely because it humanized him. It showed him as vulnerable and weak and a bit pathetic and needy. And that's what made it for me a great film because you saw him as he more likely really was uh, rather than a sort of cartoon cut out figure. Mm -hmm. And um, that I think is the better way to try to understand why such people do such monstrous things. I think this is one of the things that kind of troubles um, von Vector's son, um, isn't it? That he knows, he knew the man as this kind, loving father, caring, etc. cetera. Um, he cannot reconcile the fact that his father was, you know, culpable of, you know, such, and capable of such crimes. And, you know, he, he, he can't admit it to himself and he, he doesn't feel that, um, he, he has the responsibility to admit it. He's just, is he just, he's just in denial, isn't he, really? Um, I mean, I think to understand Horst, who takes a different view from Nicholas, mm -hmm. Horst is one of the main subjects of the rat line. Mm -hmm. they were, both men were born in 1939. Mm -hmm. Nicholas despises his father. The first time I met him, he said, Philippe, you have to understand, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, mm -hmm. except in the case of my father. Mm -hmm. And then one day Nicholas said to me, you know, your family is from Lemberg. My father's deputy, Otto Wechter, was the governor in Lemberg. Would you like to meet his son? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I would actually, if you'll meet me, I'd be very happy to meet him. And he said, well, you will like him, but he's very different from me. He looks for the good in his father. Mm -hmm. And so here are two men, both born in 1939, taking very different approaches Mm -hmm. to the stories of their fathers. In Horst's case, I think it's about survival. I think it's about getting through the day. I think he's, const he's constructed a narrative for himself based not on his love of his father, but his love of his mother who adored her husband, mm -hmm. even though he was you know, a serial adulterer, serially unfaithful. Mm -hmm. um, she loved him and Horst loves his mum. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. therefore there's a sort of transference towards the father and he'll say i'm just trying to do my duty as a good son sure. to find the good of my father sure. and it raises the question i think for all of us on a conversation like this actually and it's it's so easy if your dad was indicted for mass murder mm -hmm. 
Mm. How do you feel about him? Would, would you, do you stop loving him? Do you, you know, we've seen that story told by Lionel Shriver in her book, We Must Start Talking About Kevin. It's a similar issue. If your kid were to go into a school and shoot dead 25 children, mm. what, do you stop loving your child because that has happened? These are immensely complex questions. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't realized how immense they were. I'd grown up on one side of the story. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden I meet people like Nicholas and Horst and I hear the other side of the story mm -hmm. where there's a different kind of a silence. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. And it goes on through the generations. Mm -hmm. Nicholas's daughter, Francesca, Horst's daughter, Magdalena, bear the burden mm -hmm. of a grandfather. Mm -hmm who was a mass murderer. And it's, it makes me feel sympathetic to them that they who have no responsibility for what happened mm -hmm. went through these horrors. And that doesn't excuse Horst's denial, no. but it softens one's reaction to it. And, you know, I'm doing an event to launch the book in Vienna, in Austria, in October, uh, not the 5th of October, a big foundation is hosting it in a wonderful venue. And a couple of weeks ago, I got my uh, my the, the organizers sent me a sweet email saying uh, we've been contacted by um, Herr Ve Vector Horst. He's seen that this is up on 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 the web, and he would like a right of reply the next day. Would you would you do an event with him? And I thought about it, and then said, "Of course, I'll do an event with him." But in that event, I will feel protective towards Horst because he will not use arguments that will endear him to the audience. And this is part of the complexity. I can't stand the way he defends his father. Mm -hmm. And for I their case, what it comes from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you we're watching the film. It seems that you initially struggled with his um, his reluctance and you seem to come to have come to terms with that now. Well, way, right? well, I mean, it's been made easier. I don't want to give too much away, but um, mm -hmm. I did. I did. But make, don't give too much away. I won't give too much away. But I did make a podcast before I made before I wrote the book of the rat line. The reason that I did that was I hoped that things would come out of the woodwork, and indeed they did. And so the rat line book ends rather dramatically with a, a communication received. From Horse's only child, which has mm -hmm. had the most dramatic consequences imaginable, mm -hmm. um, and and so these are very complex, delicate issues. And you try to do the right thing. You really feel, as a writer, a tremendous responsibility. You know, I, these are not my stories to own. I, they are stories with which I'm partly connected. You'll you'll recall in East West Street that there's the extraordinary possibly the most lovely person of all, apart from my grandfather, Miss Tilney, mm -hmm. the lady who saved- yes, that was one of my next life. questions. Mm -hmm. and, and here is a remarkable evangelical Christian um, missionary who has done absolutely, you know, marvelous, absolutely marvelous things. Mm -hmm. And I needed to tell her story. Mm -hmm. it, it was yes, I think she's, she's fascinating. You know, I'm from Florida and which is where she lived laterally, right? Up until her death. and. I think it's sort of funny, funny, sad how she's one of a kind, you know, meaning that she, she's like others in that she will be one of those people who've had an extraordinary life or had an extraordinary moment in their life and then choose, you know, quiet anonymity and, and you know, in their flats by the seaside or, you know, in the sunshine. I mean, look at Lemkin living rather anonymously himself in the end, which is really so sad. I thought mm -hmm. that's how you... It, 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 I tried not to make it too sad. I met, um, again, one of the things about, you know, you write and you do an article or you do a radio co conversation or this kind of conversation is people approach you out of the woodwork. It's absolutely wonderful. And I'd, I'd done something at one point and I was introduced to an elderly lady called Nancy Steinson, who just sent me an email one day and said, oh, I, I, I knew Dr. Lemkin. She said, I was, I was his research assistant in New York in 1959, in the last year of his life. So we got together. Mm -hmm. She's an extraordinary lady. She's in her 80s now. Mm -hmm. And she told me the whole story of her work for Raphael Lemkin mm -hmm. and how it began. She, she was in Riverside Park. She was a student at Barnard College, you know, Columbia. 
and she was with a friend from India having a picnic mm. on Riverside Park, which I'm sure you know. And she saw this very disheveled, elderly looking gentleman approach. He stood on the path, she was on the grass with her friend, and he mm. said in a thick accent, my dears, I know how to say I love you in 20 languages. And that was her introduction to Raphael Lemkin. Mm -hmm. And he, he then hired her as his research assistant, writing his memoir. Mm -hmm. And it was just wonderful to get that kind of direct insight. I mean, you know, you cannot imagine the letters that I received. So I got one last week from Edmund. Mm -hmm from a gentleman in Edinburgh who said, look, it's the 75th anniversary. I do need to tell you about one of my relations um, who is a 97 year old Russian lady who was an interpreter at Nuremberg. And she was chosen to be the Russian interpreter to attend the hangings, Ooh, okay. the gymnasium in, by the courtroom. I mean, can you imagine that such a person saw things, is still alive? And, I'm very much hoping to see her. It's very mm -hmm. difficult, obviously, a very elderly lady, but mm -hmm. those memories must not be lost, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. one of the great things about events like this is things come out of the woodwork. It's amazing. Mm. Um, I think you've answered somebody's question here. They asked about uh, the rat line on the radio a year ago or more. It was a podcast, wasn't it? It was. You can you can get it for free uh, on the BBC iSounds. It's just the rat line. You don't have to pay for it. And as of last week, I'm very pleased to say you can also get it in French on France Culture, if you're a French speaker. In France, it's called La Filière. Um, I was incredibly thrilled with the BBC English language version of the rat line that Charlotte's letters are read by the great American actor Laura Linney. Mm. Otto's diaries and letters are read by the great English actor Stephen Fry. Oh, right. Wonderful. The French equivalent, I have to say, if anyone watching is uh, partial to the films of the Polish filmmaker Kislovsky. Mm -hmm. Three Colours Blue, Three mm -hmm. Colours Red, Double Life of Veronique. Yeah, my favourite films, actually. Well, I've just done the readings for the French one with Ihan Jacob, which I can tell oh, you wow. is absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, um, okay. I've come to know her and what an amazing joy to work with such mm -hmm. people on the podcast. So that's also available for free if you want to listen to it in French. I got a most marvellous... Uh, email after the French version came out from Hugh Levinson at the BBC, who's the producer, wonderful producer at the BBC. And he said, my wife and I have just listened to the first couple of episodes. We think it sounds much classier in French. Uh -huh. okay. So look, I'm going to ask another question. This is from my author, Michael Vitigiotis, who's watching. Um, he said, I would be interested to hear more about the role that Britain played in helping Jews from Eastern and Central Europe find new homes and how this affected the identity of these families, as I understand that your family came to England during the war. It's an interesting topic given the state of Britain today. How does this affect the sense of your identity? Well, it affects it a lot. Actually, my family went to, um, my family went, went to France mm -hmm. and uh, my grandparents went to France. They both escaped with their one-year-old daughter, my mother who was born in 1938. She was in, hidden in a series of Catholic homes uh, during the war, during the German occupation, survived. And when she was 18, married an Englishman and uh, moved to London. And that's why we are now British and happily British and happily French too, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so multiple identities. It's a real issue, this. Um, I, I feel a real sense of responsibility. And in fact, just to bring it right up to date, um, I, I try to imagine what it was in that time when people were presented with children and grown-ups desperate to get out of these places. And I found myself in a similar situation just a few weeks ago when um, a committee, which is called CARE, C-A-R-E, which looks after academics around the world who find themselves in dire situations and need refuge, wrote around Robin and then wrote a particular letter to me on the basis of my work in relation to a series of Afghan academics mm -hmm. who have served as translators mm -hmm. for the British and American armies 
-hmm. working in Afghanistan for the last 20 years and who have been abandoned now. I mean, this has been a news story, as you know, in Britain over the last few days. I mean, it's absolutely shocking mm -hmm. the way the translators are being treated. And uh, Cara got in touch and just said, look, I mean, can you help in any way with your university? Can you make a donation? And I wrote back and I said, I'll go beyond that. We'll take a family for a year. We'll, we'll offer a home to family for a year. That's the very least we can do. So I'm hoping that is going to happen. Okay. And, um, and it, that is born entirely from my sense of responsibility of not doing enough now mm -hmm. in these times mm -hmm. when I exist because of people like Elsie Tony and the family in France that I never got to know who saved my mum. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, mine is a selfish generation a very selfish generation and those people like Nicholas Winton and others who allowed people in there are people like that today there are many people like that today who do incredible things mm -hmm. but I haven't been doing them and I should be doing them and I think that my own family history imposes upon me a big responsibility to be doing more and so I'm hoping that we will get a letter from Cara saying we have found a family you know, we live in a house with extra rooms and we can absolutely take them in and nourish them and give them a place to remake their lives and, you mm -hmm. know, for a year or two. And I think, I feel writing East West Street has been a wonderful experience, mm -hmm. but it has also imposed a much greater sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Faceless, nameless people have come to life mm -hmm. and I've come to understand what it means to have been a young lawyer in Lviv on the face of extinction and extermination. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a wake up call for what we're going through in Britain now, which is going through a difficult period. I'm not, not making party political points, but mm -hmm. the rise of nationalism, mm -hmm. the othering of foreigners who work for the National Health Service or whatever, it's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And it, it's how it begins, what begins, what Lemkin taught us in his book published in November 1944, is that what begins with focusing on the difference with others always ends in extermination. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a lesson. Mm -hmm. so we're in a very different and difficult moment mm -hmm. um, right now. Are. I mean, please keep us updated on that. I'm sure that a lot of people watching this will be very interested in this, this program to bring refugees over and give them housing and you know, shelter and resettlement or whatever. But um, I, I wanted to move on a little bit as well, because I've got another question from the audience, which, which does actually reflect one of mine. This guy, Robert Nichols, he's, uh, we've got similar um, thoughts here on, on this book. He says, a key ch ch change um, East-West Street documents is the change of the relationship between the state and the individual. After this change, states could be held to account for killing its citizens. Is the fact that this happened at the end of a war significant? So many felt that they had been caught up in the state-driven meat grinder of war. Yeah. How much does this change in law reflect this feeling? Could it have happened without the two world wars? No, I think it couldn't have. I think it took disaster and catastrophe to mm -hmm. bring change along. And um, 1945 was a revolutionary moment. You know, people do not appreciate that until the summer of 45, the UN Charter, and Nuremberg, states were entirely free to kill their own citizens as a matter of international law. There was no rule of inter international. If a country said, oh, well, we're going to kill everyone over 60 um, because we don't like them, there may have been a rule of domestic law saying, well, actually, you can't do that. But international law allowed you know, the country to treat its citizens like chickens, as Lemkin said. If they want to destroy them, they can destroy them. And that was the revolution brought about by the ideas of people like Lauterpacht and Lemkin and many others and many governments who supported it. And in fact, this is, I think, the tragedy of what we've lived for the last four or five years, you know, the double whammy of President Trump and Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the double whammy, again, I'm not making it in party political sense, but the walking away from the 1945 moment, mm -hmm. basically saying, no, we don't want foreign judges telling us what we can and can't do. We don't want the International Criminal Court investigating the troubles we don't want. That is an instinct which is driving towards 
undoing the 1945 settlement. And that 1945 settlement is a rare thing to be cherished and to be looked after. It's not perfect. I'm not starry eyed about it. And part of my project in which the writing lives side by side with the cases and the teaching is to remind people that what was achieved in 1945 was totally remarkable and precious and it needs to be safeguarded. Mm. And I feel a deep sense of responsibility to safeguard it. Mm. You're speaking of safeguarding I mean, how, and, and, the, and the lockdown and, and, and et cetera, I just wanted to bring this in. I mean, how has this affected your work, both as a writer and, and as a barrister and as an activist, I would say? in many ways. Well, well, I'm of that generation. It's terrible to say, I mean, you can't say you love lockdown or anything, obviously. Mm. It's absolutely terrible for different generations, for my children, the generation of my children and even younger children, it's it's appalling. Mm. And I think the generation of my parents, it's very, very difficult mm. um, to find people, especially for people who find themselves on their own. We're in that sort of, you know, okay, it's a bit of a nuisance, you can't go to the theatre, you can't go to the cinema, but actually, you sit, you write, you do stuff on Zoom, and life's okay. I mean, it's not by any stretch of the imagination terrible uh, or tragic. So lockdown for me has been pretty productive. It's been a way, actually, of, you know, resetting things, what's important and what's not important in terms of human relationships, uh, and in terms of travel, which has just disappeared, and I think will not come back mm -hmm. in the same way. I mean, gone are the days of flying to New York for a day and mm -hmm. doing some event and coming back. I'm just not going to do that anymore. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's outrageous. And it's environmentally outrageous. And I think just at a personal level, it just we shouldn't be doing things like that. So I think there's a recasting. There's a, and there's been a strong sense of community also. I mean, I think the difficult times are coming. We know that in times of trauma it's been like a war in a sense it leaves a legacy that is very difficult for many people and I think we have to prepare ourselves for that and this sort of idea that we're out of the woods and it's all going to be fine and go back to normal I don't I just don't buy that I think it's going to be tough for a lot of people and we're all in this together um, but you know on a day-to-day -day basis you know I'm finishing off two books and so that's um, really pretty nice. And so what's, uh, your, what's your next book about? Speaking of which, my next book is about British colonialism. It's a very, it's a slim volume. You'll be pleased to know, <laughs> just forty pages. Okay. Place um, called Chagos that no one has ever heard of, but otherwise known as the British Indian Ocean Territory, Britain's last colony in Africa. Okay. And I'm telling the story of a woman who was the star witness in my case at the World Court who won the case for Mauritius and African states arguing that Britain must leave. And it's her story and the story of international law since 1945. And that will come out next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then two years after that, the third book in the East West Ratline trilogy, there is a minor character in the Ratline mm -hmm. called Walter Rauf. Walter Rauf was a friend of Otto Wächter's. He was um, also indicted, but escaped mm -hmm. and made his way in the end to South America, mm -hmm. where he befriended and then started working with, it is rumoured, Augusto Pinochet in Chile. Okay. And so the third book will tell the story of Walter Ralph in Chile mm -hmm. and also the arrival and arrest of Augusto Pinochet in London. You'll remember this on the 16th of October, 1998, where you couldn't invent it, he was um, indicted for crimes against humanity and genocide. Mm -hmm. So it comes full circle, mm -hmm. uh, a case that I was involved in, back mm -hmm. to um, the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity being taken forward uh, in the courts in London. So I'll tell the story of the proceedings in London. Um, Are you going to go out to Chile? Well, I'm supposed to go in November. Okay. And, um, at the moment, it's closed. I'm, I'm, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to Chile and Argentina for a month, November, December. But at this point, I'm not going to go if, I, if it's a red country and I've got to spend 10 days in a hotel coming back. Mm -hmm. I am most certainly not going. Mm -hmm. So I just have to wait and see. 
Uh, I've told my fine editor, Jenny Lord at Weidenfeld, it, it may have to be pushed back for a year. You can't write a book about these places and not visit them. Exactly, you can't. And uh, anyway, I mean, Chile, uh, they have lovely Kuchen in, in Chile as well. So many Germans they do, they do. there. They do. Um, I really want to go to Lviv now, that talk about coffee and cakes you making must. me hungry. It's a fantastic place. I'll give you an early warning. November 2022, there's going to be a, a weekend long jamboree, an east west jamboree organized by the mayor. Okay. Um, a, a whole series of events and lectures and concerts and films and uh, okay. I think it's going to be quite interesting. Okay, I'll put that in the diary. Um, I'll ask, ask a few more questions and then we'll wrap up. I know everybody's um, taking time out of their evening and you especially, Philippe, I really can't tell you how delighted I am that you're here with us. But um, just one more one more question from the audience and then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. So we have um, jo Johan Swinnen says Rwandan genocide. Um, the polemics of today about denial, stroke, um, nego no, negotiation or neg 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 negating, I guess, the genocide, negationism of the genocide illustrate the concerns of Judge Lauterpak as to risks of politicization, politicization, instrumentalization, abuse, etc. of the genocide concept, don't they? Shall I reread that? No, I've got that. I'm just reading it now. It is it's a it. question by Johan. Um, yeah. I mean, here's what I'll say. I think that Lauter Pact was basically, here's the problem for me. On the one hand, I think Lauter Pact was basically right that mm -hmm. the idea of genocide has set in stone a sense of group identity and it's become more and more powerful on the other hand lemkin is right people get killed because they're a member of a group so the law has to protect the group mm -hmm. so this is a fundamental contradiction that on the one hand the idea of genocide as a legal crime is necessary on the other hand it gives rise to the very conditions it was intended to prevent and that is a problem that I am grappling with. Mm -hmm. But genocide is a reality as a legal term, and it's not about to go away. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how you kind of wrap up the end of East West Street with your own thoughts about that, yeah. which was very, you know, um, sort of encouraging to me. I thought if I'm struggling with it, and then you're, you know, you're struggling with it as well, and it makes me feel, you know, less kind of dense. But um, this was, this is, a, this is, I really, I cannot recommend this book highly enough to everyone i've been as i said talking about it to everyone that i meet and you know if you're a lawyer or not or if you're interested in genocide or not or you know the, the concept of you know the legalities of it and it's just a, it's a beautifully written story and and uh, it's just moving and moorish and it, it really stays with you for a long time it really haunts you and um in good ways and bad and I really appreciate you taking the time, Philippe, to be with us. And here's Philippe's next book, The Rat Line, big push promo for Philippe Sands. And I look forward to meeting you again in person in another maybe I literary hope so event. so much, Kelly. I hope yeah. so, so much. Thank you for joining us. And, and our next event is on the 19th of August um, with Michael Viticiotis. Um, Thank you all for joining us um, at the Frontline Club's, Club's monthly book night. Thank you to Pranvera. Uh, Smith, the founder of the club, and, and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.